Hello everyone, my name is Drew Dameron and I'll be giving a case study on the Yokohama Archives of History. In Japanese it's called the Yokohama Kaiko Shiryokan, which means the Yokohama Port Opening Museum. First let me show you where it is. So in Japan, if I zoom in here, please ignore my pens, uh, we have Tokyo, it's about northeast, maybe an hour on the train. So here in the Yokohama Bay, this is Osanbashi. This is where uh, Japan first opened up to international trade, where Western culture was introduced to the Japanese people. And this is why the museum is also called the Port Opening Museum. So if I show you outside real quick, uh, this landmark tower right there, the famous landmark. This is the main building of the archive itself. So you can see inside there's a courtyard with a famous tree as well as the former British consulate. So if we go inside, this is the tree. It's supposed to be an ancestor of uh, this tree in this image of um, Commodore Perry and the former shogun uh, signing the Treaty of Kanagawa, which opened Japan up to international trade. Uh, the British consulate building, it was built in 1933, I believe. Uh, mostly it's offices now. It's open and you can walk through and can see what it was like before. However, the main archive, museum, and um, offices are over here through this door. So, if I take you inside here, oh, not that one, this one. So, through this door, you can see the store. They've got books for sale, some postcards as well, and then the entrance to the museum. This is two floors. It's mostly bilingual. And um, it kind of tracks the port opening, some of the ships and documents. Um, it's a permanent exhibit, and there's a rotating exhibit up above. And it's 200 yen to enter, which is about $2. The reading room, which kind of functions in the archive, is down these stairs here, and that's 100 yen to enter. So the main website of the Yokohama Archives of History looks like this. So with most institutions, the actual main site is in Japanese, and maybe they have a few other sites in other languages. So this is English, Chinese, and Korean. However, the Japanese site is always the most robust with the most information. So even just looking at the tabs and sections here, if I switch over to English, it shrinks down to four. However, it's still better than nothing. So we're going to be looking at the reading room itself. The reading room, like I said, it's in the basement floor. It has about 250,000 Yokohama-related materials, and there's seven different types of collection. There's the government-related materials, there's the overseas and foreign settlement materials, materials related to local leaders, materials related to the merchants. Uh, the silk industry was very, very big here. There's newspapers and magazines, pictorial materials, and special collections, which are um, collections donated by individuals. Now notice the Overseas and Foreign Settlement is a hyperlink. So if we go in, it brings us back to the Japanese main page. However, as we go through, we can see um, from these overseas, kind of embassy-related, diplomat-related. Um, we go through, this is America, so you can see the American naval records and information, um, dispatches, official records, Igirisu means English, like the British. So these are some British records that they have. And then the uh, Japanese ambassadors in Japan, uh, of Japan in England. Fransu, which is French. Uh, some Chinese as well. When you click on one of these, uh, American for example, it brings us to this. This is the closest thing that they have to a finding aid. So if I translate the page, it gives us a bit more information. This is the commentary, sort of like an abstract. Original librarian means uh, where this is held. So the National Archives and Records Administration, this is actually the um, American National Archives, uh, not the Japanese. However, Google Translate, when it switches over, it loses that. So you can see America, Kanko, it's inside America. Extents, years, and other information beyond this. So. That's what they've got for that. Now, before I visited, um, the first time I went was just casually as a user. 
the second time, I really wanted to um, make a nice, like, professional introduction to ask for an interview. I know it's um, my, my Japanese isn't that good, so I really wanted to make sure that they were aware of me coming. So I wrote a letter that I was going to email to them, just explaining the, the course and some questions. Uh, and then a friend of mine kindly translated it into Japanese. So when I went to go email it, I found that there is actually no email listed on their website, the English or Japanese version. They do have this button, but this is a, like a mail newsletter. So they only had the phone and the um, address itself. I believe they also have the, uh, yeah, this is all that they've got here. So I tried calling. I tried calling twice. I found out that there is an English-speaking volunteer, but I wasn't able to get a hold of them. So I kind of, at the risk of being rude, I just showed up. The, you know, the due date was approaching. So I came to the archive itself uh, with a printed out letter in hand, and uh, the timing was really good. I met uh, Nakatake-san. So Kanami Nakatake-hori, she's the senior curator there at the Yokohama Archives of History. Um, this is her business card, the English side and the Japanese side, uh, with her email listed as well. And uh, she was really great. She spent about an hour and a half explaining everything to me, and um, her English was pretty good, much better than my Japanese, so she was able to answer a lot of my questions for me. So, uh, very, very appreciative of Nakatake-san. So, my first question for her was about the organization of the Yokohama Archives. I was curious, did they had a board, um, if it was a part of the city, or if it was individually run. So, uh, in talking with her, she said that it's a part of this organization, which is the Public Interest Foundation, Yokohama City Furosato History Foundation. And then if I look at there, this is their About Us online, and scroll down, it has an organization map. And then right here is the port opening museum that I'll be researching. They also have the archaeological museum, there's a municipal city history museum. So it's technically under the city, and it's kind of the historical museum wing of um, the city's government. So for the reading room, they don't allow any photographs. However, on the Japanese web page, I did find some pictures. So this is what it looks like. It's pretty small. There's the OPEC computer here. There's a few lockers that are on the right side. There's the staff desk. There's usually an attendant here and then the archivist sitting here. So I found Nakatake-san sitting there. There's a copy machine and then these bound volumes of books. So these are uh, all basically reproduced, photocopied, um, or reprints of materials. They don't have any access to any primary archival documents there. Only staff or the museum curators can uh, handle them. Any researchers, or just the general public, uh, they are allowed to use these photocopy replicas for their research. And also, I was interested in um, the holdings a lot of their primary sources actually aren't held here. Um, they're kind of moved around and for the most part consolidated in the National Archives of Japan. And she said this is kind of because of the, like a lot of the bombings from World War II and also the earthquakes and tsunamis, they try to consolidate it into one really protected area. So it moves around somewhat, but um, for the most part, people are pretty happy and totally fine using these replicas themselves. So, to access these, there's the OPEC, there's a card catalog, and then there's the archivists uh, themselves that you can ask. For the OPEC, it can be accessed from their main page, on the Japanese page, and right here, Web OPEC. And then they have an English version as well as a Japanese version. Before I get into this, I want to talk a little bit about the organization and the metadata of their materials. So for those different types of collections, they have different types of spine labels and bibliographic records attached to them. So one example for the Overseas and Foreign Settlement Materials collection, the spine labels look a bit like this. So the top row, the CA4, is the category and collection. So C means copy. A4 indicates the type of collection that it's in. So A4 is the foreign materials. 
The middle row is the serial ID number. So this number is attached to different organizations. In this case, 4.6 is attached to the Yokohama Presbyterian Church records. So anything with that means it's for that church. And then the bottom one is the volume number. So it's book number one, book number two, etc. There's a next to the shelf of these books, there's the card catalog. And so Nakatake-san used the example of um, Dr. Hepburn. He was uh, one of the first like medical doctors here in Japan. Um, and he, he's a pretty famous topic of research, especially in Yokohama. So um, she found in the card catalog, it, it was all in Japanese, so I didn't quite understand what she was doing, but she pulled it out and I could tell um, like the tabs on the cards were uh, the Latin alphabet. So it was alphabetized. So I think it was like foreigners in Japan and then alphabetized by last name. And then she found the card for Dr. Hepburn and it had a list of different types of books that have information about him. The newspapers and magazines collection, it's a little different. The Japanese newspapers are indexed. However, the English newspapers aren't indexed. So if you're trying to find someone's name, you're kind of out of luck. But anyways, the spine labels for these uh, are also pretty unique. Um, SYC, so the very top, it's the category and collection again. S means shimbun which means newspaper in Japanese. Y is yasho, which means Western. Uh, w, washo, means Japanese. So, um, and then C means copy. There's also R, which means reprint. So it could be SWR, which means a newspaper, a Japanese newspaper that's been reprinted by uh, some publisher. Copy is just photocopies from microfilm. Uh, the next one, uh, middle row is date range, so the newspapers cover this range of dates, and then the bottom is the volume number. So this is volume number 12 of this particular uh, uh, newspaper. The metadata, so this is where I'm really interested because written Japanese is way different than written English. If we're doing archival description in English, um, for like authority records in particular, subject headings, names, those kinds of things. When we write it in, um, if we write somebody's name, there's only one way to write that person's name. If we're writing a subject, there's only one way to write that subject. In Japanese, there's basically five ways to write the same thing. So, for example, English uh, canal. All of these mean the exact same thing. Canal in Japanese sounds like unga. So, romanji is the written way of writing a Japanese word, unga. The hiragana, also this says unga, katakana unga, and then kanji unga. So kanji, these are the Chinese characters. This is like a, the conceptual ideograms. This means unga. Hiragana is more the unique Japanese alphabet. It's uh, like phonemes. This is u, this is n, and this is ga. Katakana is more for like English loan words. So if there's any foreign words like uh, coffee or tobacco or people's names. It's pretty much always written in katakana. So I asked Nakatake-san um, when they compose their bibliographic records for um, all of the books in their reading room, do they have to use all of these different writing systems? And she said that for the most part they do, um, which means that you know, having to write out um, any, and do any sort of cataloging, it's like five times as much work. Um, if it's like Japanese, Mostly, it's kanji and hiragana. So if a Japanese person is searching for a name, if they know the kanji being used, then they'll search in kanji to find the name. If they don't know what kanji are used, some of them sound the same, then they'll type in hiragana and see what pops up. If it's a foreigner, they'll probably type in katakana, and then um, they might also use English. Romanji is not used as much. This is more to help us read Japanese, more so for Japanese to access any other words. So continued metadata description. I found that the National Diet Library, which is basically the Library of Congress, um, they use Mark 21 since 2012 and there they call it Japan Mark. And according to the published cataloging rules in 1987, uh, it says Japanese name entries require kanji and hiragana. Foreign names require katakana in English and the English is a, adhering to the LC name authority. So there this uh, PDF they have online, but it's only in Japanese. So this is a screenshot from that PDF. 
And you can see here the naming authorities. This is uh, LC record, or so this is like adhering to the record, and this is how it would show up um, under their naming authority. Could also be under these variations as well. Um, here it's kind of how you would switch them back and forth. So this is uh, William S. Deal. This here says William S. Deal. So Deal William S. So you can kind of switch back and forth, or just this name itself. And then uh, this entire thing is accessed from the below uh, HTML. So if I head back and try to show you how this works in action, um, let's look back at the catalog. A famous person in uh, kind of Yokohama history is Felix Bito. Bito. Um, he's an Italian-British photographer, one of the first in Japan. So if I try searching for Bito in their catalog, this is using the, the English of it, I get 10 results, 10 items. So different books um, in Japanese, not in Japanese, um, different sorts of records here. If I go back and try the katakana, so this is the Japanese, again, because it's foreign, it uses katakana, not kanji. So if we try bieto, instead of 10 records, we get 27 books in one periodical. So there's something going on in the metadata um, where searching with different things gives you different results. And I can imagine it takes a lot of time to try to fix all that stuff. And if you're trying to connect it with other researchers, um, that's a pretty tremendous amount of work. And so I asked Nakatake-san about this, and she said that, uh, like most American librarians, they just import these records from the uh, National Diet Library. So they import the marks. They rarely write it themselves. So that's sort of a quick introduction. Kind of scaling back, I'm really curious to see where this is going. Um, for connecting this to international researchers like myself or others, uh, Nakatake-san said that there really isn't enough time to devote to helping these international researchers, especially when they're trying to help their own local researchers. Um, and they're often, you know, they're not full time, they might be volunteers, so just it's not a priority for them right now. Um, some stuff can be accessed through WorldCat, but I found out that Nakatake-san uh, a while ago, they actually deliberately removed the email address because they were getting so many English inquiries. And she's the only one who knows how to write in English, so it was taking up a lot of staff time to try to reply to all those emails. So they actually removed that function so they could focus on other things. And then the English versions of the websites, although they exist, they're not as great as the Japanese page. So researchers like myself, they get much more information if they translate the original Japanese page. It's not quite as professional because you're relying on a computer to translate the information, but it's still, you know, it, it helps a lot more. So I think that, you know, in the future, I'd like to see how the translator tool, these browser extensions, accelerate this connection. Um, in particular, this, this button right here, this translate this page, without this, I wouldn't have been able to do this assignment, I think. Um, I wouldn't have been able to access a lot of the information. I wouldn't have been able to really understand a lot of this, um, like the backgrounds and different things. And also, um, the foundation and the national diet themselves, although they do have the English options, I would much rather look at the messy translated um, versions of these sites rather than the, the bare minimum English site. So I think we also need to try to get a little more comfortable with uh, messy machine translations. But I think it's getting better maybe in the next 10 years or so. I think it'll come a long way, um, especially for searching as well. They might search, might be able to translate your searches in real time. So. And I've got my references here. I went through a lot of books. A huge, huge thank you to Nakatake-san for spending a lot of time with me. Um, there's a lot of patience, and I, it's hard for me to think of American archivists who would spend that much time with someone who's not that great with English. Um, so I really, really appreciate it. And I recommend spending some time in some other international archives and maybe watching how they grow together. And then if, when, 
if and when you do end up working in an archive, um, try to keep in mind these international researchers and what you can do to make it easier to connect all of this information together to give a more accurate picture of different events going on. So that's my presentation. Thank you very much.